Good evening. The opinions and statements voiced by our guests do not necessarily reflect the opinions of this network. Enjoy the shows. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, Birmingham, Alabama. Presenting travel writer and sacred mysterious sight hunter, Teal Gray. Good evening. Welcome to Para Mysteries. This is your host, Teal Gray, and we are coming live on the air from WBHMDB Radio in Birmingham, Alabama. So I have a great guest for you tonight at the kickoff of our new season here. And we're going to be talking tonight with Tui Snyder. She has got the most fun books that you are going to love. If you haven't already been a fan, you're going to be after tonight. And I want to bring her straight on so we can get started with her. Welcome to the show, Tui. Well, hey, Teal. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here. Had to have you. As you know, you got to be my first guest. You know, we, we're buddies. <laughs> we go back a long way. And, you know, you might not be a native Texan like me, but your books really focus on Texas. And I know you love it. So what made you fall in love with us? You know, it is funny. I actually, I grew up uh, all over the place. I lived in Virginia and Washington mostly. Then I, I got to live in Belgium and Italy. But, you know, I fell in love with a Texan. So I moved <laughs> down here. I know I got bit by the bug. So I moved down here for love. And I was a travel writer at the time, not books, but just magazine articles. So I thought, I'll start writing about Texas. And oh my gosh, it is there is so much interesting history and culture here. I was really surprised. And it's more than like because <laughs> Yes, and but I think a lot of people too just have this one idea of Texas. You know, they don't realize it's so there's so much more to it. And it I joke now that I used to write fiction, but then I moved to Texas. Because I just can't I love get that. enough of it. <laughs> I love that. Well, you know, we're going to talk about a lot of the different things you do. Um, you know, I love your music. I'm a big fan. And so, I mean, you do everything from music to, as you said, you used to be a travel writer. And I can't wait for some of the books that I personally know are in, in the backlog. But let's start out with a few and just we'll kind of hit some of the of the ones that um, – uh, tonight, some of your new ones and some of the best loved. And that way we'll kind of let people get to know you as we go through the thing. One book that I absolutely am enjoying so much is um, your your kind of epic road trip. Sometimes you could do or you're a short <laughs> getaway, anything you wanted to do. But your new book, Six Feet Under Texas, it, um, it really is interesting, and they all are, but what made you decide to release that one now? Yeah, you know, that is a good question. Um, I do like to say that my books will take you places, and even, you know, I guess it's the travel writer in me, <laughs> even if you don't <laughs> live in Texas and have no plan to go here, I have a lot of readers who just enjoy the armchair travel that it offers. Um, I do, for sure. Yeah. And, you That's know, now I think it's a great it's a great time. You know, it's a great time for people to do that. Well, it is. I was going to say. And like what surprised me, because my first book really just focused all about Texas. But my first fan mail ever came from a street magician who was living in Paris and has a fascination with the weird West. And so oh. there are a lot of people out there who just like to read about Texas because we have talked about the weird West. We've got it. But I decided to come up with this book now, Six Feet Under Texas, and I'll, t I'll talk about what it's about. But the reason I wanted to release it now is because it, you, as you might have guessed from the title, it's a little play on, you know, Six Flags Over Texas. It's, <laughs> it's, it's Six Feet Under Texas. It really focuses on a unique, famous, and historic burials in Texas. And I released mm -hmm. it now because, hey, we are all looking for something fun to do where we can easily practice social distancing. And I tell you what, historic cemeteries are great for that. And here in Texas, we have got some really marvelous ones. Um, we do. Yeah, we really so, do. And, and I think 
people also think sometimes Texas, you know, depending, like you said, on, on what they focus on, they either think it's all Dallas, you know, business and oil and cattle barons. And they forget sometimes that we do have these little out of the way spots, these little country spots that you take us to and some of the quirky graves. I love it. There are some really beautiful uh, cemeteries, beautiful burial grounds here in Texas. They are great places to take a picnic, especially in the spring and and in the fall when we here in Texas, those are times we could get outside without frying, you know, from the sun. It gets so darn hot here. But in the book, I, you know, I have 50 chapters and each chapter focuses on one or two um, strange graves or unique or historic burials. I've got Bonnie and Clyde in there, of course, but I have more lesser known ones too, like the oil man, you mentioned that made me think of this, who installed a phone line to his mausoleum. Now he joked, oh. yeah, and he joked, he would joke all the time that, oh, I, I did this so I could call all my friends from hell, but um, <laughs> which sounds so Texan. You must have been, this guy, I would like to meet him. He's not like a real character, but he yeah. actually was quite scared of being alive. And mm. uh, I mean, you, you know, that, yeah. That uh, happened. That, Mm -hmm. That's a legitimate concern, especially when he was alive. So I understand that. And that's one thing I really, I chose stories that I thought would teach you a little bit of interesting history, but show you how much things have changed the past 100 years, like stuff we take for granted, like carrying ID. Mm. I mean, I hadn't it, thought about that. I you know, I, true enough, back in the day, and as farther back as you go, you, I mean, what ID would you carry? <laughs> really? I know. Isn't it funny? But when we look at history, we, we look through our lens of today, and even I, I forgot. Oh, yeah, no one carried ID back then. Who would have carried ID? You know, even when I do research, it's hard to find out women's first names because they're always Mrs. Bob Jones. And oh, then he gets yeah. remarried. She dies, and then, you know, the next wife is Mrs. Bob Jones, and you don't know. And but, it depends on the guy. I mean, how, how much uh -huh. of a rounder was he? We could have a few of those, you know. Exactly. <laughs> he could have burned he could have it been gets quite confusing. The lady that's a killer for a genealogist. <laughs> it is. So, you know, nowadays everyone has ID. But even if you, let's say you were passing through a town um, in the old days and you're a stranger and you happen to die. Well, nowadays we can use dental records, fingerprints. Mm. So, you know, we've got DNA. We have a lot of options to try and figure out who this person is. But I found several you know, strange but true stories that involve people who passed through town, died without ID, and, you know, they didn't have any of those methods to identify them. So, you know, what are you going to do? Well, I got to tell you, one thing they would do, and I, I love telling people this when I'm giving uh, an in-person presentation, because uh -huh. I've gotten used to it. But I like to say it to audiences because maybe they're starting to nod off and I mention it and they, I, they have actually gasped. I will I will <laughs> tell them, yeah, I will say, well, let's say you died in a, a town. They didn't know who you were. They might have just sat you in a chair in the furniture <laughs> store window and hoped That's somebody true. recognized you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, today uh -huh. everything's so sanitized and, you know, that's mm -hmm. one that people just can't imagine even being in the vicinity of an actual dead body that's not already been, you know, prepared or it's in its mm -hmm. coffin or it's probably a closed casket. So that probably does shock them. It does. And you know, there was one guy who they, they put him in a chair and his dog had also died, I guess, of grief a few days later. So they, they embalmed the dog and had the dog sitting next to him, hoping that someone would identify the pair of them. But I mean, oh my gosh, we would, we would so never do that now. But that happens over and over in the past. I mean, it was just a practical, well, hey, maybe we don't know what else to do. Maybe someone will recognize you. So crazy. Yeah, and I guess, you know, the mode of transportation, you know, you had the horse, you had the wagon, so many people just walked. And mm -hmm. probably depending on where you died, you might not have even had anybody around that, you know, found you in, in time. And that's probably why the, the list is so long back in the day, even to now, the missing persons is, it goes on forever because you, who knows? Yeah, you wouldn't even have to go that far, maybe 50 miles from town, one town yeah. over. But that's also why there's so many intriguing tales of people who change their identity. Like, oh, mm. well, you, you got a bad rep in this town. You just move to another <laughs> town and change your name. So it was a little Absolutely. easier to do that, too. <laughs> Is 
<laughs> That's so funny. Well, I want to talk to you also now um, about your book, Paranormal Texas. That is a big fan favorite. And, you know, a little bit about that. Of course, it's a travel guide for North, North Texas. I think you focus there. But yeah. when you have these type of books, like what is your headspace like? You know, are you um, kind of a, a person that um, is a method writer, maybe like a method actor? I mean, am I going to go to Tui's house and find a skull on her desk? <laughs> how do you how do you decide what what you're gonna what places and stories you're gonna talk about in your books? Do you, oh my do you gosh, have are a, you a looking go-to? at me? Are you looking <laughs> at me right now? I am actually it's hilarious because I'm actually holding I in my right hand I am holding my my favorite mug, which is a skull shaped <laughs> mug. <laughs> well, glass. Tui, you know I'm a psychic <laughs> medium. I guess That's it came right. through. <laughs> that does. That is hilarious. I drink I drink iced tea in this thing all day long. Robos iced tea, and it's so my favorite mug little, ever. <laughs> that's your muse. <laughs> that is my. Oh my gosh, that is hilarious. And Larry knows. Oh, my husband knows what that is. My favorite mug. <laughs> you do not drink from that oh. mug. That's my skull mug. Oh my gosh, I feel. I feel like. I feel like I'm busted. <laughs> You're busted. I mean, don't busted. get online with a psychic if you don't that's want to see right. what's going on. I'm a oh, terrible no. person to date. I mean, you can't get away with anything. It's like you know, it's just terrible. Oh, uh, that must be why I'm single. Yeah. But so, <laughs> so you and your skull mug, um, how do you go about it? Do you just, do you get a feeling? I mean, you know, sometimes I talk to architects, let's just say even, mm-hmm. and it's a totally different thing, but I ask them and they always tell me that, you know, I, I say, you know, when you go into a place, do you, does it speak to you? Do you feel like you then begin to see what this is, this building's going to transform? form into and they do they sort of have this little spirit contact that they can't explain do you kind of get um, maybe spirits or or stories or something tapping you on the shoulder I think that happens sometimes, but I actually also, I get so much information from my readers. Like I have a weekly Mm. newsletter and they will email me ideas. Have you been to this place? Have you, oh, you should go to that place. Is, you know, this place I think is just open to the public. So readers send me a lot of information, things that they're curious about. And it's Mm -hmm. like playing fetch. Hey, two, hey, boo. They throw, they throw me an idea and I'm like, woof, woof, woof. I go running after it. (laughs) Off you go. Yes. And then I take a very historic approach. So if people say, oh, Jerry, you know, people, old man Smith haunts this house. I look and I try and find a historic record and I'll be like, actually, it's old man Jones. And, you know, I'm trying to find the truth behind it. So I take a very like people sometimes think my book Paranormal Texas is fiction. And I'm like, I kind of bristle at that because I do so much historic research. I'm like all the history in that. I'm laying it out. The history of the play of the hauntings. You go there and maybe you have something happen. But I'm going to I'm and then you can go, oh, Two, we found that there were three suicides and there was a, you know, there really was a jilted bride, but that other story, you know, so I try to find the, the truth behind the, all the stories get jumbled up. I try to find the facts for people. Oh, I know you do. Wow. I didn't even know that because I know you do so much research on that. So if it, you just, you just send them my way. I'll, I'll set them straight. <laughs> and then I'd love to go uh, there with you and you can, you can detect all the great. <laughs> really? It's kind of, it's, it's, it is funny, you know, um, it is. sometimes, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> when when we go places and, and people will be like, well, um, let's let's get set up and start trying to figure out where the ghosts are. And it's like, and they'll, uh, I do you want me to just tell you where they are and then you can set up there and save yourself a lot of time. <laughs> exactly. That's so helpful. <laughs> And that's the way to do it. That's the way we roll. Well, you know, um, let's talk about your personal experiences, because I know that you add those into the book as well. Some people might think, you know, is this just all, you know, cerebral research? But it's not. You have your own personal hunts that you go on. You go on me, you go on a lot of other people. Um, And I want to talk about uh, one place that I know you had a really cool experience, the Park Hotel. 
Uh, and in fact, oh, my yeah. parents spent their wedding night in that hotel in 1950. Oh, okay, yeah, ways back. Can you share that with us? Sure. And I wonder, like, did they experience anything during their honeymoon? Because that, well, <laughs> I'm sure they experienced something. Well, on their honeymoon. Well, I don't. <laughs> I'm not sure if uh, you know uh, any any bed shaking would have been attributed to <laughs> guest yeah, spirit true. or not. <laughs> that's true. They might have had other things on their mind. The, but that place was yeah. so active. I've got to say that was a really active place. Um, but yeah, the old park hotel. Um, I went there with uh, Beck's Ghost Hunters and Greg Stevens was there. He wasn't with his whole team, but Greg Stevens also has a paranormal team. And um, oh, you know, this was you mentioned how I add my personal uh, experiences into this into the book. I just wanted to say once again, that's due to the readers, because uh, I had a first edition of Paranormal Texas and I tried to just keep myself out of it. But people complained and readers were like, tell us what you experienced there. And every time I gave a talk about it, it was like, tell us more about, you know, what you experienced. So I realized people were fine with that. So I then I was like, OK, I, I updated it and interjected a bunch of my experiences. So anyway, oh well, let, yeah. let me st- let me break you right there because mm-hmm. I just realized it is time for us to take a station break. So oh. let me stop you there, but and that way we'll start the 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 story right back. So everybody, we'll be back right after this break. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk, only on Paranormal Experience Radio, broadcasting live out of Birmingham, Alabama. Several U.S. presidents are on record talking about the UFO mystery. Yep. Presidents Jimmy Carter, Ronald Reagan, both had UFO sightings of their own, but the current presidential campaign might be the first in which UFO disclosure has been championed by a major party candidate. DIA, CIA, it moves around, is operating a program to train psychic spies to spy and use their powers against Russia. John Ronson writes about this in The Men Who Stare at Goats. The first known sighting of a ghost took place right after Abraham Lincoln was assassinated uh, in the late 1860s during the administration of Ulysses Grant. Project Paperclip, Clinton releases it all in 1998. Possibly the unequal cooling of its surface. I say to you, still think it's a meteor, Professor. I don't know what to think. The uh, metal casing is definitely extraterrestrial. It's a place where UFO hunters and scientists gather to examine paranormal activity in the region. Some of the documents, this is bringing Nazi scientists into the United States to work here. So we fought against the Nazis. And it's not, this again is not a revelation. As early as 1947, 1946, we knew some of this, right? On the paranormal, will we see U.S. President Barack Obama's foreign policy go intergalactic in a quest for gold stolen by aliens? We'll tell you at least how the White House responded to claims the chief executive has been teleporting to Mars. But let's get to today's Capitol account. UFOs, hauntings, psychic abilities, conspiracy, ESP, cryptozoology. There are many things that remain unexplained in the inexplicable world, and we're talking about them here, looking for answers on WBHM Digital Broadcasting, Birmingham, Alabama. The truth is out there. Thank you for listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. The time is 23 minutes after the hour. 
Welcome back to Para Mysteries. This is your host, Teal Gray. I'm coming to you live on WBHMDB radio, and the chat room is open. The number, if you have a question, is 205-533-7982. And we are live tonight with my special guest, Tui Snyder. She's helping us kick off the new season here. And Tui, we were just about to get into what I absolutely love, your story about the Old Park Hotel. And so so you had a really interesting experience there. And part of your books, the charm, I think, the personal charm that people get so attached to, it's not just the history of a place or here's how to get here or here's what happened. You also add your personal experiences and that I love. So let's turn it over to you and take us to that Old Park Hotel, which is really a cool old two-story building and, and uh, you go for it. All right. So the Old Park Hotel is in Ballinger, Texas, which is a really cool town, by the way. I wanted to just explore the town, but I showed up there. I came with uh, Beck's Ghost Hunters, and they had Greg Stevens with them, and he is uh, another paranormal investigator. Now, he didn't have his whole team, but I was with some people who take it very seriously. And if any of you have ever been on uh, like an official ghost hunt or paranormal investigation you know it's not like on tv there is a lot of time all that downtime beforehand it takes <laughs> like an hour or so it is it's set, almost right? like a movie set it's almost like a movie set because i used that to is. do some 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 work on that and sometimes i mean on a 14 hour day you might work you know a couple of hours that's why everybody knows how to knit <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah that makes sense so yeah so we you know had our little command center and I was just like staying out of their way I, I offered to help and I realized you know they're taping down wires here and there they had like the the command center with the screens you know with cameras all over the place so now the old park hotel is owned by Connie and Dan Lefave and I I didn't meet Connie but I met Dan that day and he was there he showed us around he was great. Sometimes you go to a place and the person who owns it doesn't spend any time with you. Dan mm. showed us around and he told us some places that were he gets the best EVPs. And he actually like demonstrated. He gave us we we did like a five minute EVP session and mm -hmm. I he had me ask a question and then um and a man's voice answered. I said something oh. like I mentioned about like oh we've come a, a I, I go is anyone here and you're like a yep. And we're like, what? We played it back. A Texan, like, a Texan, yep. <laughs> it was very Texan. And I was like, oh my gosh. So I, they're all downstairs. And I, uh, first thing that happened is we hear someone come walking in and the door slam. Ooh. A name is called out. Then, hey, Tui, could you go check it out? I go check it out. And instantly all the hair is standing up on my neck and my arms. The door is locked. No yeah. one's there. But it, wow. it was nothing subtle about that place. So I thought, wow. So hmm. I went upstairs with my iced tea and my little skull cup. And I sat down where Dan where had told us he gets a lot of EVPs in that spot. Now, I did not know that – um, Becky had left a tape recorder going already. It was already mm. recording that whole night. And it oh. was just on the table next to me or across the little hall from me. I, I was mm -hmm. completely unaware of it. I had my tape recorder. And so I say something like, hey, I just wondered if there was one, anyone up, up here with me because I was just in the upstairs area. And then I'm counting to 10 in my head. And I hear Greg go, hey, Tui, are you singing? I'm like, what? No, but I, I know I have a very sing-song voice. I totally blew it off. Did not think a thing about it. Well, the funny thing is, the next day, we're driving home, and it was a long drive. I get my phone just blows up, basically, and it's Becky. And she's saying, um, oh, my gosh, I just, I just missed my exit and had to pull over because I was listening back to all um, the tape you know, all the recordings from the night yeah, before. Yeah, all the evidence, yeah. Mm -hmm. And she goes, and when Tui says, um, you know, I wondered if anyone was up here with me, you hear Tui singing afterwards. And I'm like, I was wow. not singing. And so I, <laughs> I instantly grabbed my, I, my headphones, and it was the first thing I'd recorded, so it was real easy to find. And on my recording, you hear me say, I just wonder if anyone's up here with me, and then silence. But when you hear Becky's tape recorder... And oh. you, it, you hear, I just wonder if I had anybody up here with me. And then you hear, I go, do, 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 do. 
doot, I do this little ditty. <laughs> and then right after, and then you hear Greg go, Dewey, are you singing? And the funny thing was, okay, so I went and listened to the rest of my recordings. Later that night, um, Greg, we were all sitting in a dark room and Greg saw, he goes, Dewey, where you at? I'm like, I'm over here. And he goes, you are? Because I just saw you walk by. Oh. And, and so there was something yeah, it was the weirdest thing. I just Your doppelganger. Even, yeah, the doppelganger. <laughs> and here was the funny part because my husband, I mean, he he goes with me to all these things and he he loves it. But on the other hand, he can be very cynical. Like he'll we'll be driving there and he'll say, I know how many ghosts we're gonna see tonight. And I go, How many? He goes, Zero, because they don't exist. <laughs> you know, something you know, something denied like that. But when I told him I He's got a him, healthy dose of skepticism in him. Oh, good grief. He is like Spock on steroids. So I played I played the two um recordings back to him and he just deadpans, just straight. He goes, Well, maybe there was another aspect of you visiting the park hotel mm-hmm. from from the multiverse and then he just see? walks away and i'm like who what what yeah <laughs> well see that's something let me t- stop you there for a second that's mm-hmm. something though there's some people this is something actually i'm going to be interviewing larry uh, uh-huh. in a few weeks and the thing is is that you know a scientific mind like his it's not that maybe they don't accept you know to him okay that's a different dimension there's some proof there there's some something measurable you know in that experience that's what they need they can't mm-hmm. just say oh yeah it's a ghost and have nothing to back that up you know so it's not necessarily for for some people who always go oh science they're non-believers it's not yeah. true there's he, just verbiage difference there's a difference in verbiage and there's a difference in what they need to often i think you're right it's something like that you know it's just something a little different but hey but when they when they agree on something you know that you're like yeah. oh i'm in there you know, that's interesting. And another thing is he knows that I would never lie to him. And so he sure. has such trust with me. So when I showed him, I, I took a picture of a little, a little like just one second video of a, a ball of light coming out of mm-hmm. a room and where I kept getting a feeling from it up at the Hugo, Oklahoma train depot. Oh, yeah. When we did and, uh, the, the event there. Yeah. And everyone was, this one guy kept saying, oh, this room, there's so much activity. But for something just drew me to that other room and I took a like. Uh-huh. a live photo of it and right then a ball of light came out and Larry has watched that over and over and over and he's like what was that I mean so yeah. he, he will accept things he knows that I would not lie and I, I think he's just well, so skeptical for he's afraid sure. of, you know. yeah and and you know orbs are something that is hotly debated and mm-hmm. always probably always will be because you know some people discount it completely because they say well it's a bug or it's dust however mm-hmm. if you really would be, you know, a, a good sport about it. And let's go through the whole trail. Even somebody skeptical like Larry could say, wait a minute. Now, this ball of light is moving differently mm-hmm. or it's obviously not a bug. It's not this or that. And in fact, you know, we'll we'll do that at some other time. I don't want to take up your time tonight. No, no, but, you know, you've been you've seen <laughs> some evidence I have of orbs mm-hmm. and different things. In fact, an orb has literally come out of my hand. <laughs> I have a little seen ball it. of light in the daylight in front of mm-hmm. several hundred people. And it wasn't a trick. It wasn't anything I did. And and it just danced around and danced off. And, it you know, uh, and then it showed up again that night. Spark. And it, mm-hmm. yes, and it showed up on a boat with me. Sometimes it's in mm-hmm. pictures with me. But you've also seen that video where I'm talking to orbs, different ones, and, <laughs> and, and communicating with them. Yeah, that's a humorous one. I said, because I'm trying to be so quiet. Then I drop my voice so low. I sound like. Like I'm a 911 operator or something, or you know, yeah. or, or or an or an 88 operator, maybe, right? And and but they move, they move towards you when you talk to them, or they they do, they go to where you're sending them, and and dust and bugs can't do that. And so your ball of light, same kind of situation. It, it wasn't a bug, and it wasn't uh, dust. So, you know, it's, it it's was very a ball interesting. Ball of light, yeah. It yeah. just went zipping around the corner. I was still, I was so flabbergasted. I was like, what? I was so glad I caught it because. You know, well, like, you know, happened. energy, uh, we we don't die. This is, you know, mm-hmm. we, I think we're just energy. We just change forms. And why not be a ball? It could, it could be, you know, it certainly yeah. could be. Yeah. 
Well, actually, you know, it was so weird. I thought about this recently. Uh, now I'm shifting to something that's, you know, not related to Paranormal Texas. It's Paranormal Oklahoma, which I haven't written, but whatever. That's okay. Um, but that, that orb, you know. We're getting the out, scoop. <laughs> at, the, at the Haunted Dream Depot up there in Hugo, Oklahoma, which is such a cool town. Really great cemetery. Mm-hmm. But that, that ball light came out and it kind of just, it just flew by me. And I went to follow it. I just kind of went walking around and that is what I actually saw I've never seen like a full body apparition I saw this lady walk into one of the rooms that was closed off I mean she flitted mm. off and I was just like I was all like hey what are you going in there for <laughs> and then I ran Whoa. over there and realized it's, oh it's you're... possible you know Jamie Mose who's a friend of ours she's a paranormal mm-hmm. investigator um and she was at my event Hugo Oklahoma mm-hmm. that you're talking about and she prior to that had mm-hmm. seen a woman solid as could be walk into a room and she also had some communication with her so we'll have to have you both back on another show and talk about that hotel i mean because there's there's enough to pack out the time Mm -hmm. for sure well real Um, quick i just wanted to add that i described what she was wearing because i could still see that i didn't see her head I, i only caught sight of kind of a mutton chop you know poofy a blouse and I the pattern on it when I described mm-hmm. it to Jamie she goes oh yeah that's exactly what she was wearing I'm like oh, oh my gosh I saw this thing uh, and that's this is, crazy I, I have seen misty things before I've seen you know lights I've seen but this was a the person I mean like I said mm-hmm. I was a little bit like I was a little bit you know hey what are you going into that room I thought it was a person getting away with something you know what are you doing going into there that's yeah. closed off well yeah. and in fact there there was somebody that fits that description that used to work there and watch over the children so that's a whole nother thing but we we really mm-hmm. should I'll do a show about that and I'll have you guys on because uh, yeah. and also the lady that runs the depot she's she's fantastic so we'll <laughs> we'll do that but I want to take before we get too far in to the hour. Um, I want to take it just a second. And can you let everybody know, because listen, you're never, nobody's ever going to get tired of of finding out where you go and what you do. I want them to be able to get your newsletter. And also you're offering uh, a free uh, little book um, for people and you have your YouTube channel. Can you tell us about that real quick before we get into, I want to talk to you about, um, your cemetery symbol expertise and and what you're going to be doing for our upcoming segments. Sure. Yeah. So uh, the best thing to do, I guess, if you're interested in what we're chatting about tonight, you kind of want to come along for the ride. I I would say go to my website. It's Tui Snyder and it's just T-U-I-S-N-I-D-E-R.com, just my name.com. And when you're there, there's a link that says click here for a free cemetery symbols guide. And this is just, this little guide is, I made it because it's the topic that got my husband interested in cemetery symbols. It's what different hands mean. You will see mm. hands on headstones and they can mean everything from sacrifice to sudden death to martyrdom to, you know, secret society handshakes. They can mean so many things. So I made a quick little guide uh, with photos in it and so you can download that and um you know you will be signing up for my newsletter when you do that you can unsubscribe if you want that's fine i make it real easy they to do so to. No, well, no, no. hopefully they'll stick around <laughs> and then every sunday i send out a newsletter and tell them hey i'm gonna be on teal show or whatever is going on <laughs> um but i also have a link at my website if you want to go to my youtube channel um because i can only put in my books you know so many photos and sure the, the youtube is such a great way like i just put one up about a haunted doll museum where you and I were on a on a um a paranormal investigation there and I you know had so many photos that I couldn't put in my book and so I ended up making a you know 15 minute video with um some information for there and so yeah so that's a good good way to go about it I would say if you want if okay you're interested. perfect yeah okay so that's what that's what they're gonna do I want you guys to do that <laughs> now <laughs> okay it, so we're it. gonna yeah, go do it right now Teal said <laughs> yeah. um, it's like the new Simon says <laughs> so we're gonna be focusing on those cemetery symbols um You know, and every segment that you're going to do is going to be every other week with us right here on Paramystery. So I'm excited about that. But to just go back um, to your Paranormal Texas book, just just for a moment, 
uh, before we go into our first segment tonight with Susan Hill, I wanted to talk about any haunted cemeteries maybe that uh, might be here in the um, North Texas area you might want to talk about. Oh, I know <laughs> why you're asking <laughs> this. I know. Okay, all right. I was really resistant to the ideas of cemeteries being haunted because I do so much uh-huh. historic research there. Yes. And you, uh, uh, and Teal yeah. said. Uh-huh, exactly. <laughs> so we had just been on an investigation. It was the next morning and you and I went to the cemetery, Elmwood Cemetery in Mineral Wells. It's like 930 in the morning, you know, not a spooky hour, but Mm-mm. you are always telling me, like, you can tell when I've been to the cemetery because I end yeah. up with a little posse of children's spirits around oh, me. Oh, listen, yeah, before you tell the story, I got to say this. <laughs> My, I have, I had an office in um, historic downtown Denton, Texas, up in what used to be the old theater there. So it's this gorgeous, grand old building, you know, and um, so my my office actually one of the doors when you opened in the back it actually still took you to backstage yeah. so it was really the hot spot in that, that was cool. you know in that place is really haunted and um so two you know different people come up i do interviews there and and you know just was my office it was my space to write as, as well and so Tui would come up you know there and then i'm just like Tui. <laughs> you you've been to the cemetery today. Well, I have. How did you know? Every, I know because every time you come near me after you've been to one, you have all these kids with you that I have to be like, "Shoo, no, you've got to go back. You can't stay here because I've already got haunted children that died in a fire here." So you all know. <laughs> so I know like you do, and I don't. You attract. Yes, children. Absolutely. I've had other people who um, attracted, you know, spirits, but they were adults right but no you have these little kids and they're just trotting around they're very well behaved but like mm-hmm. I'm always like nope you got you you guys are gonna have to leave with Tui or you got, you can you don't have to leave let's say but you can't stay here <laughs> yes and so when we were at Mineral Wells and you made me go and read that you, you go go read the epitaph over on that one you've got to read it so I go oh, over there yeah. and this the headstone says the epitaph says the orphan's true friend and mm. so I kind of knelt down to take a picture of it. And as I knelt down, I hear children giggling. It's nine in the morning. There are no children around. But in my mind's eye, I could see three little kids. That was interesting, too. But I, I, I stood up thinking I knew right where they were. You know, I was going to go see these kids. And then I was like, oh, my gosh, I had the goosebumps. And I was like, OK, Teal, I got to eat crow. I guess cemeteries can be haunted. And I just, you know, <laughs> and so I do have several in paranormal Texas. But, yeah, you... <laughs> Yeah, you you kind of brought it all to a head that day when you were like, "Go I read just, that." You know, have to instigate things every once in a while. Have to have to stir it up. <laughs> stir it <laughs> well, up. You did stir it up. Bring a, a, a new little spirit to life there for you. Well, we're going to take a break now, and we'll be right back. But when we come back, we're going to be uh, on our segment with Susan Hill. So we'll be back with you soon, everybody. You are listening to WBHM, Digital Broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk, only on Paranormal Experience Radio, broadcasting live out of Birmingham, Alabama. Oh, come on. I'm Southern, but... Um, nope. That'll do. Hello, I am Kat Hobson, host of Paranormal Experience here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. I enjoy having guests from all areas of the paranormal, from ghosts to ufology to cryptids and beyond. You'll find some of the best researchers in their fields bringing you some great information. Join me on Wednesday nights from 8 to 10 p. Eastern here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting.
This is Jason Bland, host of Midwest Paranormal Presents Paranormal Soup, where we stream live as a webcast every Sunday night, 11 p.m. to 2 a.m. Eastern, with guests who will blow your mind. Live ghost box sessions where you can call into the show to see if the spirits will talk to you. And the World Wide Web of Weird, with the latest in paranormal news and evidence. We're bringing the weird every Sunday night, 11 p.m. to 2 a.m. Eastern, on our Facebook page and YouTube channel. Don't forget to follow and subscribe. You are listening to WBHM, digital broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk only on Paranormal Experience Radio, broadcasting live, live, live out of Birmingham, Alabama. Thank you for listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. The time is 45 minutes after the hour. Hello, everyone. We are welcoming you back to Paramysteries. We are live on WBHMDB radio, and we are coming to you from Birmingham, Alabama. Tonight, we have been talking to my special guest, Tui Snyder, and now we're going to be joined for a special segment with Susan Hill. Now, Susan has 20 years in the paranormal field. She is a best-selling author and speaker, founder of Raven's Light Entertainment Company. Company, and she is one of the most wonderful channels, really, I have ever seen work the dowsing rods. It's pretty amazing. And her photography makes me a little bit jealous, I have to say. It's really beautiful, and so many people love it. And she is going to be on Paramysteries every other week to share some of her urban legends and haunted location stories with us from her books that are out. So welcome to the show, Susan. How are you? I'm well. How are you? Doing great. Thank you for helping me kick off the new season. Absolutely. Now, what are you going to tell us tonight? I can't wait. Well, um, it's really funny. I did not realize that the show was out of Birmingham, but the uh, (laughs) urban legend I chose is out of Birmingham. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you little psychic gal, you. (laughs) I love um, that. Synchronicity. (laughs) So, um, actually, what I want to tell you about is an urban legend that um, is, as I said, out of Birmingham, Alabama. It's um, there is a place called Sloss Furnaces. And Mm. so it was it was the main place where they turned coal and ore into steel. Mm -hmm. Um, And it was open between 1882 to 1971. And that's recent. Yeah. Yeah, it actually was. Yeah. Um, And you can go there now and tour just during the day. And it's an amazing place. Um, Just a tour. Just the history of it is amazing. Um, But the, of course, the spooky part of it. (laughs) There's got to be. um, (laughs) Always. Of course, the the worst time to work was the graveyard shift. And that was mostly due to the foreman whose name was James Slag Wormwood. And um, so this urban legend is actually about the slag of sloss furnaces. And so during the summer months, um, those temperatures, of course, as you can imagine, it would get super hot there because it's so humid anyways. Um, But working around all of that heat and everything, it was probably absolutely horrible in there. Um, But... The, during the, well, slag, as they called him, during his <laughs> time working there, um, 47 workers actually lost their lives, which was 10 times Ooh. more than any other shift during the history of the company. And it was wow. because he would basically try, he was trying to impress his supervisors and mm-hmm. by making the people work harder and harder and doing dangerous things that were not I mean, OSHA would have just rolled over. <laughs> and especially in the middle of the night, you know, most exactly. people, uh, they're, yeah, that's not yeah. the best time to press on. <laughs> exactly. And so um, in October of 1906, Slag fell, or he may have been pushed mm-hmm. off of one of the largest furnaces called Big Alice. 
Um, wow. And he basically just disintegrated into the melted ore. Um, and and still to this day, people say that it was probably a group of workers that were tired. They were just tired of him working them to death, literally. And yeah. um, one subtle they kick and off him. you go. Yeah. And mm-hmm. so since then, people have said they've seen the ghost of Slag and he continues to torment the living whenever they go in there. So, um, so I've actually been there. I was just about to say, have you been? (laughs) Yes. I've actually investigated the place and um, it was a short investigation, but it was uh, the, the sheer size of the place is just, it's immense, but it's really, I mean, you get into some of these places because, you know, they had like little, they weren't really tunnels, but it was kind of like tunnels with the things over it. Um, kind of. Oh, yeah. Kind of, it's kind of like their passageways and they're, yes. they're connected. They're connected spaces. Sure. Right. And so there was one one spot where we decided there was only five of us um, mm-hmm. and we decided to set up in this one little tunnel area because everybody had said that you would hear people walk. You would hear footsteps in that area. Oh. So we sat down, we turned on our equipment, and we were in the process of setting everything up. We hadn't even really gotten started, and you know how it is every time sure. when you're setting up, that's when everything starts happening. <laughs> yeah, it's best to just know. kind of walk in recording, right? Just exactly. like, I'm just going to go. <laughs> <laughs> but they, um, so we're we're setting stuff up, and we get everything kind of set out, and we're just fixing to start asking questions, and all of a sudden we hear, this blood curdling scream and it was mm. it literally made the hair stand up <laughs> i mean on all, i think all and we just kind of sat there like what was that <laughs> oh my god i love it when it's like something like that it's so bold you know and and yes. you've got all you guys who are so seasoned i mean could you imagine if you had a newbie there they would still be running oh, right <laughs> And that was, we all just kind of sat there like, and, and, and it was so funny because one by one in the group, we turned on our flashlights. Like, yeah, um, <laughs> I feel more comfortable now, except unless you start talking to it and it's communicating through your flashlights and then you yeah, don't feel so flashlight. comfortable. <laughs> it, was, it sounded like, I mean, and I know part of it was the echo through the metal and everything, but it truly mm. did sound like it was very close to us. It was mm. It was probably so right loud. behind you, Susan. <laughs> probably. It, they usually are. <laughs> that seems to be. I got to let me break you for one second there no, and just fine. say to, to everybody listening. She, the, the reason that's sort of an inside joke is because on more than one occasion, but one that there is a photo that just will, you talk about curl your blood, <laughs> curl your blood and raise your hair. She's like, talking about her dog and she's doing something with the dog and it's just, you know, supposed to be such a little happy moment. And I'm like, who is behind you? And she's like, no, I'm here alone. It's just great. Oh, look what she's doing. She can fetch or she can roll. I'm like, no, no, no. You need to turn around now you need to get out of that house now and and it was the scariest spirit standing it behind her like, it oh looks like somebody my with a god hands mustache i mean you could see his yes face. but he was menacing yes, oh my was god Ooh, yeah um that was something else so okay so you do have spirits <laughs> that come stand behind you terribly scary um but so <laughs> So did did that continue? Did the sounds and the voices did that happen? That, did you get we there? did hear a no, we we heard a laugh, mm. um, and it was right as we were. We didn't have anything else happen for the longest time, and then right when we were starting to put stuff away, we heard a laugh, and it was very. It was a male, definitely mm-hmm. a male, um, and it was almost like it was coming from over in the shadows somewhere and you know how you just feel like you're being watched and that was the whole time we were there it truly did feel like there were eyes on us the whole time and so like I said it was a short investigation I would love to go back and do a longer one because I've never been there so I I'd like to go on that next time let's let's do that that would be that would be interesting yeah that would be great it's amazing you know, that's uh, one thing I do love. And I think that, you know, when you go on these paranormal investigations for, for anybody listening and you think, you know, I would love to do that. 
but my partner, my other half, my whoever that's going to go with me is not into that. I always say, listen, you know, it's not all about just the, the spirits coming through the paranormal aspect. There's so much history to these places. Yeah. And many of them, you know, if you are um, into photography or videography, anything like that, even beyond history, there's a lot of different things to interest, you know, many people uh, that might even be skeptical about this, you know, uh, and they could still enjoy the trip with you. Just as you said, the history and all that thing, you know, the photos that you get out of these places, Susan. Oh, That's my goodness. Geez. It's a, you need That's to have like a dozen funny. coffee table books, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that's part of my, you know, I just, sometimes I just get lost in that, just trying to get the picture of those beautiful, I don't know, it's that old decay. Um, and just to me, I love to stand in those historical places and imagine what it was like. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, just, just think about back in their day yeah yes and well, um and you know there's so much energy there that that is just if you take out the the you know the scary vibe of it you're still going to feel residual energy i think of the people okay. whose just lives were spent there i mean there's a lot of energy just in you know they needed to make that work you know uh, it was their livelihood people are depending on it you know it's a certain times through history when jobs were so scarce and you know you had like you were talking about this guy he was so rough on them but what else could they do they couldn't buck that system because they needed the money you know so eventually you just have to kick them <laughs> into the furnace you know but uh but yeah that's that's amazing and i've heard a lot of people have you know said that's really like one of the most haunted places in the country oh it is it's yeah it's on the list of of i can't remember what its rank is but yeah it's it's supposed to be one of the most and and honestly pulling up to the place you're just like wow because <laughs> I mean, in size <laughs> yeah <laughs> yes it's just huge and wow. and just the, again all that energy and even if there's not something intelligent there you're going to have i mean you're you're going to have all of that energy that's just kind of locked up in there it's a the, the recording of yeah, people the doing residual so stuff you're have yeah. residual yeah you're definitely going to have you know some you were you were amazing with your equipment and with the dowsing rods and everything and and I'm going to have you on the show in a few weeks so we're, we'll get into to that in depth then but just for people listening I want them to know that you are such a professional at this uh investigating you set up all your equipment you take all of the measurements as you go in and uh, so you know things that are giving off energy you know so when you say something is is happening or there's some energy this is not random you already know the baseline readings and this is something above and beyond what is normal uh just just wanted to add that because i want them to know that right. you're very and, professional in what you do and it's also important to have that healthy skepticism you need to because mm -hmm. you want to stay on the scientific side of it as well i mean you can have experiences but unless you have I mean, it's a cool story. I mean, I have thousands of cool stories. We all have thousands of cool stories that, yeah. but if we don't have anything to back it up, then it's just a really, it, it, it's a good story. Um, but it's whenever, you know, I think that's part of it is that, that ultimate search for that evidence. We want that evidence where we can say, look, I got this on several different pieces of equipment. Mm -hmm. So if yeah. we can explain this away, awesome, but I can't figure out a way. I 100% agree. And I, I'm always saying, you know, people don't like it. They're like, you can't be skeptical. Deal. I am. I'm a skeptical believer because I don't think every bump in the night is Aunt Tilly. I think you either ch need to check for a raccoon or a break in. Yes. Somebody's breaking in your house. So like <laughs> check the obvious first and then exactly. we'll get into who you're talking to because it's probably not Aunt Tilly. But it's it to me, it's it's figuring out, taking out all the other aspects that it could be and debunking that. But that's the beauty. Like you said, you get down to what I call like the 1%. And it's that 1% right. that should keep every single person on the planet up at night because 
it's real. <laughs> it really is. And it's weirder than you can think. And sometimes it's scarier than you want to think and yes, believe. But absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. But the science, there's nothing weird about it. The science, you know, uh, it backs you up. It's yeah, it's a good thing. It's, a, it's, it's great. Yeah. And well, now I see, wanna... even whenever, Oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. No, you go. Even whenever I use the dowsing rods, um, you know, I can't scientifically back that up. Um, but I mean, there is a science to it, but people don't want to hear that. Um, sure. but, <laughs> but with dowsing rods, I always have a, a different other machines going because I want to be able to back it up certain things. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I'll have a recorder going just in case somebody says something. Um, I, I usually want somebody videotaping. I like people to take pictures, you know, um, have other pieces of equipment, um, just so we can have them interact with something else too. Gotcha. Yeah. You know, and that's, that's, um, <laughs> that's the, mo that's a key. That's a key thing for it. You know, um, I love that these you're going to be doing these um, segments every other week. That's so amazing. And I want to just say for everybody um, that you you have uh, your books out. Can you tell everybody about what books you have and also um, where they can get them and, and get in touch with you? Um, yes. So I uh, my books are all on Amazon and they're available on Kindle. Um, the first one I actually did with Jamie Mose and that you spoke about earlier. Um, and it actually is about how to kind of get started in ghost hunting. It's called respectful ghost hunting, um, because uh -huh. we're heavy on the respect part. Um, and it also tells some of our stories uh, of uh, our investigations and stuff. And then I have another it's kind of a little booklet out that's about dowsing rods that tells you how to use them, how to protect yourself, how to cleanse them. Um, and then I'm actually, actually tomorrow, <laughs> um, my first of the series of urban legend books will be coming out. Okay. And, um, Congratulations. Thank you. And it's um, the urban legends of the USA. And okay. so the first section is Alabama, Alaska, Arizona, Arkansas. Um, I, I'm, I'm putting them in sections because it's so much. So I'm basically doing 13 store, 13 legends of each state. And okay. um, so it's fun. Some of them will have eyewitness accounts. Um, some of my own and some of them for, are from locals uh, that I actually reached out and got their stories. Um, and I also put the locations of the places. Um, so it's just, uh, it's, it's a fun book. They're going to be very fun, um, interesting stories. Some of them are well-known stories and some of them literally only the locals know about. So. Oh, okay. I love that. As, now, is this one of the books or do I have any illustrations in this book? Yes. Yes, you do. Ha ha ha. All right, then you get to see a little of my uh, artistic stuff, guys, yes. in, in this book. <laughs> and they're wonderful. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. Well, I appreciate that. I, I don't know, but uh, I, I had a lot of fun doing them and I was really uh, thrilled to be asked to do them. Well, Susan, thank you so much. I think it's we are out of time. So uh -huh. um, I will talk to you in a couple of weeks. But thank you for that. A really great segment. Absolutely. <laughs> and everybody, thank you for joining us tonight. I want to thank my guest, Tui Snyder. We just loved talking to you and listening to your experiences. And everybody, again, this is Teal Gray uh, with Para Mysteries coming to you from WBHMDB, Birmingham, Alabama. Thank you so much for being on this first um show with us and we look forward to meeting up with you every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Central. Thanks so much. Good night, everybody. Bless you. Feel great. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, Birmingham, Alabama.